All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Deer Gear Podcast. Today, Dorge and I are having some fun, and we're talking about all of the learning experiences that he had that went into the development of Fire Knock products. Dorge has something like 47 or 48 patents in the archery industry, and we talk about how he learned what he learned to develop those products. And he stands by a really bold claim that he will not make something for archery if it's not 50% better than what is already on the market. So it's really fun to hear the things that he messed up along the way and what he learned and how he learned those things because not everyone's perfect it takes some time and from the outside looking in it seems like George just knows everything so this is quite the conversation to learn about the things that he didn't know going into developing these products before we dive into this podcast we have a couple quick announcements number one today we are on the way to the great american outdoor show in harrisburg pa we will be in booth 927 i will be in the booth personally building exodus mmt tailor built arrows so if you've been wanting to try those you're gonna be in the show stop by the booth and i'll build you a set take them home and see what you think we'll also have the all new exodus rival cell camera and we will have the industry leading exodus render so stop by the booth grab some exodus gear thanks for supporting us we really appreciate it also guys if you can't be at the show right now is an awesome opportunity to save some money on a dozen or a half dozen tailor built exodus mmt arrows this is the first edition exodus mmt and right now they are 15 percent off on the website use the code show 15 at checkout exodusoutdoorgear.com follow the script on the build It's super, super, super simple. If you've ever been wondering how to get the best darn whitetail hunting arrow, we figured it out for you. All you do is give us your specs and we build the arrow for you. It is a super streamlined, super easy process. And when you get those arrows in and shoot them, you will not be disappointed. So if you've been on the fence, you've been listening to the podcast and not sure if the Exodus MMT arrows are for you, now's a really great time to try them out. Again, code SHOW15 at checkout, save 15% on the Exodus MMT arrows. With all that being said, guys, I hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. Have a good time. Have fun with it. And hopefully we'll see you in Harrisburg the next 10 or so days. Welcome back, everyone. Today, George and I are sitting down. We're going to have a fun conversation. It's a snowy day in Illinois and Ohio, so we figured we'd hop on here and do some chatting. How are you doing today, George? I'm doing fine. I mean, we got about three inches of snow, and the temperature outside is like 38, so everything is melting. (laughs) It's Uh, melting. (laughs) That makes for an ugly time. I know. That's the reason I figured that maybe we want we want to go out dinner. <laughs> we'll just stay home and get maybe get some chicken noodle soup or cream of chicken, and then make some rice and call it the day. Sounds like a good cold weather day. I know. I know. <laughs> so, George, today, uh, what I want to talk about is something we've like we've hit on it in a lot of the other podcasts, but we haven't dedicated any time to it. And I want to talk about some of the failures that. You well, have gone would, through to get to where I you're would at. Not, I would not call them failure. I would call them my learning process. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, the, the biggest lessons learned are when something goes wrong, right? Oh, yeah. Trust me that we got enough things going wrong. I mean, just like I would start with our, our number one product, Finac. See, when Finac was uh, moving from a military product to a civilian product, that's based on the Finac M. The first thing I recognize, uh, <clears throat> See, the first thing it ever was, was uh, I was helping two separate groups. One group is uh, uh, with the original tracer group. The other one is with the go tip group. And because they are the one who actually provided the arrow for the, uh, for the instant runway project. And what happened is that I learned that you do not need that kind of uh, performance and power to deal with a normal bow compared to say an 18 gauge shotgun shell. <clears throat> bow is not gonna have anything like 13,000 pounds per square inch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> Which of course, uh, the first round of the of, of the final I made, I thought like, okay, it's not gonna be that far. So I go backwards. 
So I figured that I'm not going to have end caps. I'm not going to have uh, cylinders. I'm not going to have anything to protect it because it's not going to be needed. Well, that's back in what, 2006 and things changed. What happened is that uh, the block target comes out and everything is A-OK. -okay. So I believe it or not, back then when Finac first go to the consumer product, that is no end caps, which means that the Finac is nothing more than a knock with a circuit board that click to the knock with the battery just hang underneath the knock. But then uh, people would be amazed how, how much force is being applied to that nine grain battery on the original BU battery. Original BU battery is come from Panasonic. It only got nine grain, 9.1. And then of course, so we got the Koreans to make our current BL. That's about 9.3 to 9.5. And then the Chinese are making us our BL. That's about 9.5 to 9.7. And then the BX depends on the chemistry from, from my dedicated US company. That chemistry just not very stable and the weight is everywhere. <laughs> But, but if you want to deal with negative, neg negative 55, I don't think you have much choice. So that said, let, let me give you some numbers. So at least you got an idea how much force we're dealing with. That nine grain battery on a 300 feet per second bulb shooting into a spider web target exceeded 160 pounds of force. Yes. You know why I know? Because back then, that titanium wire that's holding the double loop finite is the brick strength of it is 168 pounds. <laughs> well, when you break it, what does that mean? Well, you exceeded it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then the first thing I do is I go ahead and uh, decided, you know, I would go back to the original military process. See, the original finite actually got a full canister in it. So the circuit board, the battery, they all go into a tube and then you put it in. Well, they're very much like the original tracer. You're looking close to 50 grains. Ask yourself this question, do you, with the days that everybody is so concerned about weight, do you really want to put a 50 grain knock on your back? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. So we try other methods, we try double wires, we tried loop wires and so on. Well, we find out, of course, why it's not lightweight, why is it heavy? And so they all end up to be ridiculous weight. Finally, we find, oh, by the way, the large, if as as you don't go over 2764, do you know that aluminum by machining can be, it's about a third the weight of plastic. Oh, wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah, I never thought that would be the case, but if you machine aluminum correctly, it can be close to a, about a third as light as plastic. That's if I have not went through the process, I would never even dream that. Yeah, that's pretty But then, But then of course the, the world we know of, you see originally I was thinking of making a plug, simply a plastic plug and put it on the back. No, the weight is 300% heavier. So instead of doing something 11.2 grain on the XS, like, like your MMT size arrow uh, end cap, that's about 1.5 grain. It's closer to four. Oh wow, yeah. That's that a adds lot up quick. Uh, yep, add up quick. And it's all add up in the wrong place too. I mean, yes, it's gonna be more forward in the front, but still. And everything that doesn't look right. See the original, I use plastic screw and so on. Find out the tools that people use. Not that most artists are not very careful. <laughs> they figure they always slap things together and call it the day. That's fair. Uh, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> What was the end cap solving? See, the end cap, what happened is that in the original days, we have the double loop wire. So in other words, it very much, see the, the, the design inspiration of them is uh, based on the Berkeley snap. So I redesigned the Berkeley snap to hook the, to the, the neck of a battery so that you can connect and disconnect it. Because as, if you're reading really to fishing, you know, when you twist wire together, as long as you don't think it a to extreme, that why I have the exact strength of whatever that is, sure. especially if you twist it correctly. Well, I twist it correctly. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually even go so far to go play that wire, you know. Which is now, of course, uh, right now the wire we use is about a third as thick as the wire I use because I don't need the stiffness. 
Sure. And yes, it's a GL5 titanium wire. Now, I, now I'm simply go with uh, uh, go with a brass wire and then stainless steel because the current wire is do absolutely nothing. It does no structure in it. In the old days, the uh, the original final uh, circuit board wire is to hold the battery there. Yes, it actually hold a hundred and sixty something pound. Dang. I mean, you may not have seen it. It was a really cool design. Yeah, <laughs> I went through three. I went through three generation of it. But in today's bulb, the problem is that that wire system works very well as long as people are using the uh, uh, the block target. The reason a lot of people may not understand the problem of the wire breaking is not how fast you shoot. Yes, there's a factor in it, but the biggest problem is how fast it decelerated. We find out that on the spider wheel target at a 290 to 300 feet per second, that nine grain battery will break that wire. Oh, wow. It's not a if. If not a if, it will. Of course, the moment you use a block target, you can handle up to what, 315? Because the block target is a friction-based target, uh, target. So the arrow don't just stop. It slow down. Sure. I got to look so up the spider web target. Yeah, I mean, it's nothing more than... It, it, what happens is that the outside is a, is a, piece, of, uh, it's a piece of cloth, and then you got, a, uh, you got a piece of Kevlar in the middle. Oh, uh, okay. So the arrow is actually stopping on the Kevlar. That's all it is. I got it. That's the reason the when it when it when it when, it, when the arrow stop it, it actually do a lot of damage to the arrow. That's the reason in even with a spider web target, maybe that's another thing I, I want to talk about is that a lot of guys figure that the, if if the target stop the arrow, everything is hunky dory. No. The the that sudden deceleration can cause a lot of issues. As a matter of fact, if you use a lot of arrow concept and you shoot the target at short range. I'll tell you, the arrow concept arrow is going to be that layer separation breakdown is going to be doubled. If oh, really? More. Yes, because you think about it, the arrow is going to shock and it's going to go to external, a lot of internal vibration and external vibration and in compression. What do you think under that shock? What happened to the glue that is supposed to hold the two layer together? Well, yeah. that's going to give. Yeah. So that's the reason I say for most of the vertical bow guys, I told them shooting between 315 to 3. Don't go over three, 360 on a vertical bow side. As a matter of fact, cross bow side too. The moment you go over 360, the current target environment is just not going to be great. Sure. You're going to break a lot more stuff. And which is also the time that I learned, like, okay, uh, a lot of people hear me say, if you shoot a fine knot, lighter knot, or not lighter knot, you should always, after you shot through an animal, you should always change your knot. The first thing out of the mouth, you said, oh, the thing must not be durable. I say it's not a matter of durability, it's how it's being used. Just like how many times you can drive your car and wrap it around a tree? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. is the car not durable? <laughs> you don't do those. So that was one of, one of the problems. You said, what happened? You said, when you shoot the fire knock, light a knock, say into a target, they're within three inch from each other. Okay, what you are really facing is that imagine this arrow hitting the hit the target first arrow, no problem. If you say three to five inch, especially on a on a long draw, guys, that the arrow is thirty inches. After the arrow hit the target, what do you think the arrow is doing? It's flapping. And if the arrow happened to hit the other arrow side by side, what is your force? Your force is no longer linear. Yeah. Or, see, assuming the forward backward is your x-axis, now you're doing a y and z-axis, and you happen to hit the circuit board with that force, you're literally going to lift the IC off the circuit board because the force is that much. Yeah, yeah, that's why you told me in the beginning, don't shoot groups of them. Yeah, not just groups. You said you don't want you to be far away because see, when the arrow hit each other on the tail side, that's the reason when you shoot group. If it's a close group, of course, obviously, you do impact hit. But people say, oh, I'm three inch from each other. Now you do a sideways slap. Yeah. Of course, that took me a while to pretty much write that into my menu. And that's one of the, um, not a mistake I make, but the mistake a lot of customers make. And then, of course, the, 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 of course, right now in the 166 world, 
and also mention the new HIT systems or the out the what the out the the LP system from Eastern on the on the two thirty five. Those inserts are no longer following the AMO standard as that it had to be hollow. Those are solid. Oh. Now imagine if they are solid and you glue the insert in, how are you going to install the final end cap in it? Of course, the final end cap installation, as a lot of people understand, is that you want to put the O-ring on it and then you put the super glue inside and you push the thing down. Well, if, you, if the fund is blocked, where do you think the air is going to go? The air is going to go around the O-ring, which means that when you push it down, there's no glue around the O-ring anymore. And then in the case of 166, the glue is going to do it even worse. The glue is going to left on the wall, which make, now you put the 166 in, put the battery, the circuit board, the moment you put the battery, guess what? You can never recover the battery. <laughs> yeah, it's in there for good. Yep, that's the reason I, we, we, we do solve that problem. We sell the 166 with the, uh, with, we offer a number 19 drill bit, which is the 166 ID. So after you install everything, if you want to be sure, you buy the number 19 drill bit, which is a 166 of an inch. And then you clean all the super glue gel that you left on the wall to the end cap. But then you can, of course, in some cases, if there's not enough glue, you can use that drill to drill the end cap out and restart. But this is where the problem is, spec pressure. People say, oh my God, it's so complicated. So many things to consider. As I said, the more you know, the more you don't know. <laughs> yeah, that should be the title of this podcast. Yeah, it's like, you know, it doesn't work anymore. So you now find ways to improve it. So a lot of my more advanced customer, they learned if they want to use the final, they install the NCAP before they install the insert. Unless they use my outsert with the Aero Concept system. Now, of course, it's the best of the best, besides the stalker. Well, I don't want to do too much advertising yet. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that pretty much is where the fine knock uh, original errors that we have. But then uh, the, the thing keep growing and growing after, what, 18, up, up to six, 17 years? I don't think we've got any major problem. From this point onwards, I think if anybody tell me that the final is not working, I can pretty much tell you it's user error. Yeah. Well, one thing that, uh, one thing just not too long ago you were working through, you had uh, some, it was what the crossbow, the new crossbow mm -hmm. knock, the yes. uh, aluminum crossbow knock. There were some things going on there. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was a tough one. I pretty much tell, the, tell anybody that, don't trust the diameter of the Raven R500 shaft, a uh, string serving. It's too thin. They're going to regret it. No, nope. a few of my dealers insist. Does Raven have decided it's going to be a 0 0.127? So I must make my knot to fit 0 0.127 because people won't like it if they had to get a new string. Yep, I got it soft. <laughs> October 1st, 2022. Guess what? They changed the serving size from 126 <laughs> to 133. <laughs> Imagine that. Because I know what happened when you have a serving that thin. You're going to, even with, without my knock, they're going to suffer or knock failure. It's too much pressure on too thin a surface. It's like, it's the same thing as like a knife. If your knife is sharp and you try to use something, use something to hold it, it's not good. You want to increase the surface area. So what I really do, if you make a super thin area, which technically you make the string behave like a sharp such object. That's the reason you start cracking knocks, blunting knocks, bending knocks, because the surface is too little. I mean, remember, force is, I mean, friction is force over area, so does deformation. And so if you decrease the, the total surface area with the same amount of pressure, it's going to deform it. There's no way around it. Yep. And, uh, and even uh, that actually was a pretty interesting subject because see, when I was doing the, uh, the, the, the crossbow knocks, at first I figured that since it's going to be strong enough, but strong enough as in the sense of, uh, I, I built the, the Rhino knock for the Excalibur, which is based on the new Rhino system with the anti-drive system. Then I used 7071 again on the original version of the, of the 127 Raven knock. 
mistake. <laughs> the aluminum is so high because 7071 is about 81% uh, strength of stainless. Well, guess what? Even I ran all the edges out, the moment you shot it, it freaking cut the serving. <laughs> I say, okay, what did I do now? I mean, the anodizing will get it hard and so on. So I have to move from a type two level three to a type one. And then I also changed from 7071 to 66, from 775 to 6061. So I dropped the hardness by about 300%. But well, guess what? It worked perfectly now. <laughs> <laughs> And just like when life gives you lemon, you make lemonade. That's right. So, so since uh, Raven is changing the 127 to 133, that's at least that's the number we uh, we have confirmed with the latest products. I have renamed the old UNAC, Dina, because the Finox C crossbow nut is 125. So calling the 125 C plus makes sense. And yeah, then I will sense. rename the new UNAC, U plus. And in order not to screw them up, I actually laser engraved the word U plus on the new 133 uh, aluminum knock. I mean, just like how much, how many, I would not say how many much learning do you need to do to take care of those problems? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, mean, if you, mm -hmm. I think, uh, I think I just, it's so fascinating to me, all of the, like the trials and tribulations people go through and like a, a company like Raven that's just it's surprising to me that it took like they didn't take your word for that or or even know that to start with well everybody knows better that's yeah that's fair and until and, and just like me I thought I know better just like when I I mean that's going to be my second part of Aerovain when I built the Aerovane one, I figured that I know better because I read enough. I read two books about aerodynamics on, on, on airfoil. That should be good enough, right? <laughs> oh no, I even built wind tunnel with Jeff Bailey. We actually built an entire wind tunnel system using multiple vacuum, using a, 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 a larger tube to thinner tube to increase the airspeed. Because see, you can't just design something without testing. So we built wind tunnels. Yes, we build homegrown wind tunnels to test airspeed. I think you're still on some of the demo stuff. You're still on the, uh, the video is still on the internet. You can see how we test those Aerovane one. We Where's that see at? With, actually on a Vamo, one of the uh, video provider besides YouTube. Vimeo? Vimeo, yes, yes, yes. I think it's still on it. You put Aerovane, I think it's still on there. It was pretty interesting. We were, we're discussing how the airfoil is gonna behave. And then when I finished this airfoil, I, I I figured that, you know, everybody like it, except they say it's too heavy because it's close to uh, 12 grain each. I say, yeah, everybody want, because at that moment, blazer is only about six or seven grain. So I say, you know what? Let's cut the Aeroving one and merge the middle to form Aeroving two. And then, of course, after that process, I figured I don't know better. I got Professor Selig and Professor Lele helping me. Professor Selig become my, uh, we actually, I, I, I retain him as my permanent advisor. He is one, he retired now. He is the one of the world premier expert in low speed airfoil. When I say low speed, that means it's not, sub, it's not sonic, it's subsonic. I show him Aeroving one, he looked at me and say, do you have a, do you have the, the STP file on it? <laughs> I said, why? You say, then we can calculate how much lift and drag and CG and all the rest of the goodies. And then the first thing he was holding my vein and he was looking at me really weird. He say, you noticed your vein is extremely smooth on the surface. It's like polished. I said, yeah, I pay extra money to polish it. <laughs> this is like one of my favorite stories. Oh yeah. I see, I pay extra money to polish it. Then you start looking at me straight. You say, you know, that create a lot of surface drag. <laughs> I say, what do you mean by that? You say, just like, imagine if you got a smooth golf ball, that thing won't fly. <laughs> see, then I instantly notice one thing. Y'all truly don't know shit about aerodynamics. <laughs> I mean, it's like, okay. I really don't know anything. 
So I, I start to listening and then the professor really recommend about five, actually seven books. I read five about aerodynamics. So as the more I read about it, I say, oh my gosh, I really don't know anything. And then I go all out. I start doing multi-texture and everything. So the Aerovink 2 original version and Aerovink 2, uh, 2.0 and Aerovink 1.1. I go there and I change the texture on the left side, on the right side of the vein, you know, really, really go all out. The frontal part, I remember I put zero point, I put 50 drometers on the frontal area and then down to four drometers, my four drometer on the second portion and then all the way down in three levels. Well, it solve a few problems and create a whole bunch of problems. Physical, application, and legal. <laughs> I mean, it's like, can you imagine just by doing what I just did, I created three separate problems. <laughs> First of all, the Aerovink 2 that comes out with target, everybody love it because the Aerovink 2 I mean, you know, the original Aerovink 2.0, at that moment, based on what we have the data now, the Aerovink 2 will turn about 210 revolution every 20 yards compared to the 90 to 120 now. Because you've got micro texture on two sides. And not to mention it's much thinner than the current version. Well, you know, sometimes when, when light gives you lemon, you make lemonade. And of course, everybody who use it pretty much tell us, it is great for, tar for target, but no broadhead will fly with it. Because at that moment, the Aerovink 2 was literally breaking broadhead on impact. Because it was spinning All too the, fast? Yes, and not to mention, you, you won't even hit the, you won't even make to the, for the target in most cases. Because it's spinning so much and most of the broadhead are not meant to spin at any rate. Right. Because just remember the blazer only turned between eight to 12. And Aerovink 2.0 is doing about 150 to 210. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's all crazy. And then what happened? You said, okay, what do we do now? I figured, well, you know, we just call it target, but similar thing happened to Aerovink 1. I said, well, this is not good. Well, just when I was thinking how to solve this problem, I got a letter in the mail. I got sued. Because a new artery product on a pattern stating the left and right of the vein is different texture. Oh. That was the, on the pattern that was from, uh, from, uh, from Quickspin. And of course I show them, this is where I find out and this is what I use. It's not, te the texture is not just like yours, but when they write their pattern, the pattern is written different texture left and right. They, they covered all their bases there. They, the, the bases cover more than they should, but since, since they are one of the first pattern, and uh, I step on it. I mean, I'd admit, I mean, I was, I was not angry. I was just disappointed. Then um, they are very kind. They say, well, you know, then I, 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 I say, give me a few days, let me think through it. Then I say, well, you know, I got a really good airfoil. There's no problem for me have the texture from the left and the right be the same, as long as I have different variation from front to back, because their pattern don't carry, don't cover front to back, but mine does. <laughs> there you go. So I, call, I, I talk to them and say, hey, how about this? I will redo my mode. I will change the texture in sort of left, left and right different and different zones. I make the left and right the identical zone so they're identical left and right. They say, yeah, no problem. They were very kind. They say they even give me, uh, it's like so long ago, they no longer, I don't think they sell quick spin anymore. I'll just tell you the detail. They give, they give me a license to sell off my 2.0 and 1.1, Aerovink 1 for $2,000. I mean, that's extremely cool. I mean, I can't thank them enough for doing that for me. But now the good part, in order for me to use the same mode to work with Aerovink 2.1, I have to grind the mode, <laughs> which make it thicker 
and then I have to put new texture left and right. So I didn't take the pick. I didn't touch the texture on the back. I touched the texture in the front. So what happened? The arrowing tool got heavier, thicker, harder. The spin weight jump dropped from 210 to about 90. So now initial 60 or 60 or 90. It still bought it very well. <laughs> 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 because what happened is that the, the aerodynamic elasticity memory on the aerowing tool had diminished quite a bit. That's the reason it was not doing good. Hey, can we hold a second? Yeah. Let me pause it. So you can see that that actually, the moment we dropped the spin rate of the Aerovin 2, as I said, something like something happened for a reason. But then at the same time, you know, the it, me, as I read more about aerodynamics, I read, I had more discussion with Professor Selig. I was thinking about all the latest airplane design with this is about the arrow wing too. How I know it's a true delta wing. Of course, delta wing have some benefit and some downside. And then we talk about the delta vortexes, how it was forming in the front. And I said, wait a minute. Why don't we use the same thing like airplane did with a winglet? Because see, every single major company in airline or put a winglet on because it was that much money saved. You see, why don't we use winglet too? And then of course, since I'm gonna make a new mode, Aerowing 3, I now don't have to have the grinding issue. I don't have the thick thickening of Aerowing 2. And I even go one step further. I learned about the uh, logarithm based surface texturing. In other words, airflow based, how the speed of the air movement from, from the close to the fuselage away. So instead of doing perpendicular zoning, it's actually now, it is a curved zoning. And then I also learned about how the tip of the winglet is the most where airflow is, so then, which means that they have the highest texture. That whole process just like, oh my gosh. So when I build Aerowing 3, Pretty much everything we learned. Am I, am I, am I going to one day build Aerowing 4? The world is not ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Because Bring they, it on. No, it's not you. It's that the broadhead is not ready. Uh, because it was snap broadhead like it was out of style. Because you think about it. Just think through the number. The blazer is 8 to 10, 8 to 12. The Aerowing 2 is nine to what, 90 to 120 in the first 20 yards. And then at 60 to 80 yard is doing about 150. And then Aerofin 3 is doing over 300 every 20 yards. Now the dip, I mean, can, can you increase the rotational speed and make it even more efficient? I says, yes, we pre yawn it. But then how many people are able to handle 425 revolution every 20 yards? Yeah, yeah, the broad, well, how many broadheads, right? Exactly. Not even. I mean, I'm 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 already pushing my swing blade at that already. But with that, it's just like above and beyond. So, real quick, just in case anyone's listening, thinking like, what what's the benefit to them to the actual arrow spinning faster? Well, it's not just spinning faster. But first of all, they need to understand the arrow vein, which you already experienced, is that it is a true airfoil. So you really don't do much for you if you shoot under 260 feet per second. Can you give you some benefit? Yes, but being a true airfoil, texture airfoil with aerodynamic elasticity airfoil, that airfoil don't make sound. The airfoil do not caught with wind, crosswind. The airfoil do not deviate your broadhead when you shoot it, if the broadhead is made correctly to spin. That's where the big deal is. Just like if you only fly with a singular, say, propeller engine and you got 80 miles per hour, maximum top speed. So the question is that what's the benefit of that plane and a car? Answer is that if you got a Corvette, a ZR1, take the car. <laughs> <laughs> but if you really go higher speed and you want to really start using the speed of what the aero can do, the aero wings are shine. That's where the difference is. You need to know what's going on. You need to know what you're up for. Because see, it's like, if you are not wanting that, that performance and you put that performance on it, just like, 
I, I like to always use car, just like if you want, if you just purely want to enjoy speed and you also want to haul products, that's not really a good compromise. Sure. So sometime somewhere down down the line, you decide which way you want to go. Because if you don't, you're gonna you're gonna end up suffering. Yep. Suffering as in not getting what you need and getting a lot of headache. Just like the, the original Aeroving 2 is really good because it's actually behaved very much like Aeroving 3. I mean, it's close to Aeroving, you're doing 210 already. So for most people who use it on a broadhead, it don't fly. So what good is it? It's no good for anybody. Yep. So, you know, Aeroving 2 is a, oh, oh, and then I also learned because Aeroving 2 and Aeroving, Aeroving 2 come out in 2007, okay? We were telling everybody how to modify Bissenberger jig, how to modify Jojen jig. It's all okay if you don't shoot over 290. <laughs> <laughs> the moment you shoot over 290, <laughs> it is not good. Because the, the fact is that the airfoil has to be, now you've got three airfoils. If three airfoil is spinning off center, Ooh. what do you think is going to happen? Chaos. That's exactly what happened. Yep. You, you end up, the whole arrow on the backside is spinning so chaotic. Because see, remember, in most cases, the drag force is sort of working, but the moment you airfoil, the, it's a true lift. And if you do not get perpendicular balance lift, you don't get spin, you get chaos. Yeah, I can yep. see that not. I can see that not going too well. No, and then I and then at first I was thinking of. Uh, I went into something like a Cenus Archery. I worked with them because uh, they they make a better Pittsburgher chick adapter. They give me about a quarter degree for three veins. Yeah, it saw worked for vertical bow. The moment the moment we try to put it on the three eighty feet per second cross arrows. Uh -uh. Ain't gonna fly, especially with Aeroving 3. It's just like, oh my gosh, I didn't know it can be that bad. I mean, it's like trying to say, I'm just gonna patch my tires on my Ferrari F40 and go for 100, uh, 180 miles per hour. I would guarantee you won't even hold the steering wheel, it'll be shaking that badly. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much the same thing with the Aeroving 3. And then I'll say, you know what? I was talking to other people. I would say, how about I help you with improving the, the, your, your jig and so on? They all looked at me, I was crazy. They say, nobody in that kind of accuracy. Well, I hate Why to not? be called nobody. I hate to be called nobody because they say <laughs> you'll be causing too much. So I say, if I'm building, I'm going all out. That's the reason if you look at the Aeroving jig, <laughs> I got ceramic ABEX 3 on the index. And then the index ball is a zirconium oxide, ABEC five bearing on a titanium, uh, on a uh, on a, on a seventy seventy five aluminium with a type two level three anodization. So when you click that jig, when you click into that spot, which how much play you think you got? I mean, that's where a lot of uh, mistake was learned. I also learned, uh, you know, you just can't make three hooks and try to do the world. Mm -mm. Because uh -huh. originally I have a 246 hook, a 500 hook, and also a 300 hook. Well, if you look at arrow size, just using the basic 246 as an example, okay? You are shooting the carbon tech cheetah. What is the OD of that shaft on the 246 ID? 310. Oh, wow. Yep, because the shaft was that thin. The wall was that thin. Yeah. But then when you look at uh, Carbon Express Power Driver, what's the OD of that shaft? Close to what? Uh, three, it's about 321. Okay. It's huge. Because yeah. if you look at a power driver, it's extremely heavy, it got a lot of weight to it and so on. Then, and, and not to mention original, everybody told me, thought you should make an adjustable chuck. So every single arrow can be used. And then they also tell me, oh no, you really need to make a, a, a helical vein. It'll be the best. <laughs> well, I sit there, I learned, I went through the process. 
in order for me to make a helical clamp, okay? First of all, you need to understand what a helical clamp is supposed to do and what other people claim they're able to do. That's two different things. Very different. Yes. What you want is that you want a clamp with, with, with the edge of the clamp to holding the vein to curve at whatever degree you want it to be. Remember, whatever degree and wrap around the arrow based on the degree you need. That means that clamp had the handle from say an Eastern ACE, which is barely three millimeter, all the way to a 2764, which is closer to 400 thousands. Now, if you put it on straight, then you're dealing with tension, right? But what happens if you're dealing with an arc, which is helical? How many clam you think you're going to make to fit that? Oh my God. <laughs> so I say, why not just make one day will fit all of them? Like some other people did with wires and stuff like that. I say, think through the process. When you use wire, how many pressure points you got on it? It's beginning and the end and no pressure in the middle. So in order for me to get it right, I need to make a clam that's adjust, which is etched with an arc. Then I need to use neodymium magnet opposite with the, with the, with the uh, uh, nickel titanium wire in the, in the downside. So I go fit anything. Now the question come by, do you really want to pay $100 for a clam? I have no way. Exactly. But based on my limited engineering knowledge, that's about the only way they can make it right. So what's the other choice? You don't make one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you just make Aerovane 2 that spins like mad anyway. Right. I mean, so then the next thing that people say, Dodge, you know, you, 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 your thing is so good. I just don't want to change the chucks. I mean, after a while, you know, I, I listened to them. I thought that it's not that difficult. I can design an adjustable chuck. I did. Now the question come in. And of course, in production usage. If you fit cast, do you want me to give you a crescent wrench or you prefer a set of sockets? Sockets. Exactly. So what's wrong with the crescent wrench? Time. It's a compromise of everything. Yeah. Time and so, effort. Yeah, because every time you, you use the first one, you cannot guarantee in the same spot. Even I, I really designed a pretty decent uh, uh, adjustable, adjustable uh, chuck, which is not like a three fingers holding onto an arrow. If you look at some before 2012 catalog, I still have that. Oh my gosh, it was like, it was, it was good and it was bad. It was good for a few customers who are very careful, but let's be real frank. How many people would do arteries are that careful? Definitely <laughs> the minority. <laughs> yes. And then if I demand such careful and so on, what do you think the first result from anybody will use it? This stuff don't work. Yeah. Yeah, too much friction there. It's not even worth it. Right. It, it, it's just like you—you you got too much adjustment. You got the, the you don't hold the arrow tight and so on. Yep. I mean, even to the point that I—I I try to make some customer happy by adding, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, a, a knock chuck. People say, "Oh, you was the best. I can just use the knock." Okay, let's step back one second and think about the knock. The knot is a piece of plastic that is molded that go into an arrow shaft. How many knot you know that the knot throw is actually the center of the arrow? I can tell you none. You just think it is, it is not. Because when you flow it, just like you look at my fine out knocks, I even show you where the left and right is. Yeah. Because that is difference. So if there's left and right difference, it says there's no up and down difference. <laughs> So, and if you think you can trust it and really fudge the arrow, um, if you really don't care about that detail, go for it. I mean, if you're shooting an Eastern 2219 on a Mako knock with the cone back, well, you're already off what, two, three degrees. It really doesn't matter. But if you're shooting a crossbow at 420, 480 feet per second, uh, that's not a good idea. Especially with arrow main. I mean, of course, if you should blazer and so on, you really don't care. Because see, and other people, a lot of people keep on telling me, hey, you know, with a blazer at three degree offset, the arrow shoot better. 
No. The reason you saw the arrow shoot better because the blazer is giving you more drag, slow the arrow down, that's the reason you shoot better. If you look at Tony Warden's that result, they will tell you the high, uh, the high angle is actually only thing it did is drag the arrow down. Yep. So you have parachute, you have control, but what do you lose? Speed, you lose energy on the whole process. But at the same time, just like the, the result he give out on the, on the Raven L10, it lose close to 50% energy. But when you start with close to 180, after 50% after loss, what does that mean? You still have 90. Yeah, you, <laughs> <That's more> than, <laughs> you're still doing pretty good. Exactly. So a lot of times I, I think people need to look at what do you really need and what actually happened. At the same time, you know, when we were doing the scoreboard uh, velocity, I mean, especially with the final aerobot G, which is the arrow wing three with a gyroscopic head. That is the arrow, if, because it's heavy, heavy, heavy. It got extreme momentum. Based on the slug force, we are looking at that arrow lost less than 4% energy at 100 yards. Wow. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. It is but ridiculous. But this, this is where the power and weight come into play. Yes, and people say, you know, if you shoot a heavy arrow, you really benefit. I don't disagree with it. As long as you're winning with the result, you you have that kind of abundance of energy to loss. Right. But then, then at the same time, if you are shooting, say, a normal vertical ball, and you have about 70 pound KE to start, do you really can can you really afford a 50% reduction? No. Okay, you, uh, assuming that you're going to maintain with a super heavy 600, 600 grain, you're going to lose a lot less because of the mass. Okay, but what kind of trajectory are you dealing with? That's yeah. another thing I learned. It's a so, big deal. Yes, it's a big deal because if you look at the deer 43 yards, the deer step two step diagonally, and you use the same pin, you're going to miss that deer altogether. Yeah, so I just went back and reviewed. Um, I remember, I think I told you about the podcast that I had with the Matthews engineer, Mark Hayes. And yes. he, he told me about a study they did. And I just went back and uh, listened to it. Cause I wanted to like go back and revisit that now that I have more knowledge from speaking to you. And mm-hmm. I understand his uh, point better now. And what he said was they did a test with a 400 grain arrow and a 600 grain arrow. And mm-hmm. the test was based off of a Matthews bow, which starts with like their 88.7% efficient is what their, mm-hmm. their claim is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when you went up to 600 grains, mm-hmm. you, gained, you gained 6% in your kinetic energy, but you mm-hmm. lost 27% of your trajectory. Correct. And when you bow hunt, anytime you got distance, your trajectory is, is key because you just steered step diagonally away or towards you. And you are at a 40 something yard with this 60 green, 600 green arrow. And you you have not adjusted your HHJ site or whatever, you're gonna clean this that deer. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you you have a, a a financial mind, right? So if I told you, let's put this in in uh, different terms and see how people think about it. If I told you, George, you're gonna make an investment, and um, you have to, or I have to give you six dollars, but you have mm-hmm. to give me twenty seven back. Is that a good deal? Of course not. Everybody <laughs> understand it. But you know what? People at that moment, because they, it's very short viewed, and the same time, I, I saw, again, a lot of guys, like, I have a discussion with another gentleman yesterday. He was telling me how his 600 green arrow, 60 pound pool, 27 inch straw was shooting like a dream. I say, you must have a really good range finder on your neck, and every time the deer move, you range it. Yeah, he said, really I sure do. Dream. He has a really slow yeah. dream. Right. That is where the problem is. I mean, just like, you know, the guy from Russia and a few other guys would tell you, if you know exactly where your target is and you are very able to know the distance, the heaviest arrow always win out. But the problem is that if you don't, if you are not knowing exactly the distance, the trajectory of your arrow, of where it's going to land, you must well not shoot. Yeah, you're just throwing darts in the wind there correct and of course we know how everybody is a backyard rob robin hood when you go and you and go and miss so many deers 
no, nobody heard about those, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that pretty much is what the uh, arrow vein mistakes I have. Well, that, that, that was in a, it's funny, um, like what you just mentioned there, like how many deer you end up missing. That's kind of how this all started, right? You were missing a bunch of deer, and then you shot a deer, and the arrow slapped it sideways. That, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, this on a quick spin. I still remember that in Martino, right on the mix makes with the dove field. <laughs> it was like I was, I was, I, I was staring at the deer. I'm, this is a dumb, deep, dumb deal. I shoot it, slap. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> the what, was the setup? what was the huh? setup then uh that one was let me think that will be the i uh, just that will be let me see yes that will be my q2 which i just uh no it was yeah it was my q2 just before uh terry from archery custom told me don't use don't use those thin broadheads and the broadheads not flying right I need to go and get the musty glue on. That was what I shoot the final gear. That was how long ago it is. <laughs> it was like, most people just don't understand. I, I, things do not just come because you think about it. You went through, I went through so many unfortunate unseen events. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a big misconception, right? Like a lot of people that we present this information to they all base it off of like oh well that's just that's good in theory but how's it applied to deer hunting like george is a deer hunter like we're not he's not just basing this stuff off of theory like this is real life stuff yeah because you know why what i see when i when i retired divorce in 2005 i hunted 117 days i think that year and I, 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 I'll say this again. I mean, it was the funniest moment of my life. I was yelling by my current lovely wife. I say, lovely, you're hawking a dryer. I need to go hunt. And, and halfway through the deal, I saw, remind myself, wait a minute. I spent freaking three years in Cycatron wearing carbon suits. And after about six weeks or six months, depends on how much exposure, we have to burn and throw away the suit because there's no way on hell you can recharge active carbon. It took 1,350 degrees Celsius. <laughs> and I'm recharging my Cabela sun shield jacket. And the dryer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, sorry. I mean, it, it just sounds so stupid. <laughs> that was my aha moment. Because then everything's all coming into play. So wait a minute. This is supposed to everybody know is true, and it is not true. What else is not true? Well, the quick spin is not aerodynamically designed. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, a lot of broadheads are not are not right. I mean, that's the reason when I when G five first come up with that uh, 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 what that squaring device, I'm using that religiously. Now I'm thinking myself, wait a minute, why am I squaring my insert? If I have to square my insert, if the insert is CNC machine, if the insert is CNC machine, not uh, based on the uh, based on the screw machine, the face of the insert is perfect, right? If I have to square the insert, what does that mean inside? <laughs> this is cockeyed, isn't it? <laughs> so if I have to square the insert on the get go, the insert is going to cockeye. What happens if I screw a part head to it? <laughs> I mean. These things like that make me rethink everything. I mean, I, I, I make a promise to myself, even today. I mean, it sounds a little bit far-fetched, but I tell you, this is what I promise myself. If I'm designing any product, if it is not, I repeat, if it is not 50% better than anything else, I won't bother. I mean, that's the reason you notice every single one of my product have one major feature is that it is the theory the approach is different from anyone else and your question is well that's not 50 percent improvement i say you just sit down and think of what it does and what it, what the other does on what it, the bad product does when you think through it and then we can talk numbers yeah because i really keep that really strict to myself i will not make any product if it will not be 50 percent better 
than whatever is currently in the market, or it does not in the market. I mean, one of the one of the fun thing I remember I first show you is my Aerobot, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And do you, you know how many people told me that it doesn't work? <laughs> Probably a lot. Yes, and I told them I will, I will just like everything Finox sell. I give everybody a thirty day unconditional exchange and refund. The only thing they lose is shipping. Yeah. And for a few international customer. I will even accept the, uh, the exchange and refund, but I will not pay shipping. So if they do not make my, like my product and they pay a ton of shipping, yes, they have to ship it back for me to get a refund. But I will not simply say, oh, since you don't like it, I will send you a label and you can just ref and, and refund you too. No, that ain't happening. Yeah. Because see, I give you enough information. You, you believe in it, you bought it. And right now I'm saying that the only thing you lose is shipping. And if you don't want to lose shipping, well then the only way is not to buy. Yeah, or keep because, it. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, because he, I, I think I, my product is, uh, is, there is enough out there. And if that don't make you feel like this worth the investment, which I call it, I mean, the risk, and the risk is really quite small in US because you're talking shipping. Worst case scenario for most product you're looking at back and forward, $20. Yeah, that's so a twenty dollars high. Yeah, that's on that real high side. Yeah. So if you cannot accept that, well, then, then you shouldn't buy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you, like you said, don't take it from yourself. Don't take it from me. I mean, the opportunity is there to try it for yourself. Any any of this stuff. Um, right. Because see, if you bought enough stuff, and you maybe say you bought three hundred dollar worth of my product, and you play with it, and you say you don't want half of it, and send it back with ten bucks. So you just got to play with everything for 30 days. And by the way, it's unconditional. I mean, when I say unconditional, I mean unconditional. The only, con the, the, of course you can't say, well, I lost everything and refund me. No, that's not unconditional. Yeah. Unconditional, that means I need to have that thing back in whatever form, include whatever I need it back. So I know that you actually tried it. So it's like tried it saying, uh, it's no good, I lost it. I mean, let me tell you how bad the situation get. One guy told me he bought my fine arc, he used it and he shot it into the woods and none of them lit. And he insists I pay for it <laughs> because he can't see anything. In my early days, I figured out I'm not gonna argue with the customer. I go ahead and refund him. Next thing you know, the guy was going on, I think it's whatever forum it is, telling people how stupid I am. He just tell me and I give him free stuff. Wow. But at the same time, um, a lot of people didn't recognize you, sh you should be ashamed of yourself because you are nothing more than a thief. Yeah, what goes around. And a liar. Around. So, but from that point onwards, I say, I, I don't care what it is you need. Give me back what I have first. Because yeah. the, I don't want to be, I learned from my mistakes. And if you don't want to give me back anything and just tell me that you lost it in the woods, like a few people, I shot two in the woods and I can't find them. Send me two new ones. Ain't happening. Yeah, no, thank you. No, I say, why did you do that? Can't you know where you're shooting before you do that? Oh, I expect it just light up so I can find it. Uh, I expect a lot of things too. <laughs> <laughs> and this is not what I expect. And this is in writing. So that's another thing I learned with customers. I mean, when I first started to find out, I remember I asked myself and I talked to my, my lovely wife, what should I do for warranty? He say that, what would you consider fair? I say, if I don't want it, I want my money back. That's the minimum of, uh, of uh, even as, uh, as seen on TV, they always said, if you don't like it, you got your money back. Yeah. Well, I think I would do one better. I'll give you 30 days to play unconditional and then I'll give your money back in any shape or form. Well, I keep my board since 2006, it have not changed. So I'm pretty proud of that. Yeah, that's good. So, I mean, did I learn any new thing? Yes, if you don't send me back, there's no deal. <laughs> you have to send me back something. Well, that's pretty much how the final and arrow thing come into play. And I mean, just like a lot of times, unfortunately, just like even with my arrow bomb, I mean, the arrow bomb is another good experience. I designed the arrow bomb original only to fit a 716 bushing. That means I, I require everybody to drill their 
the riser, put my bushing in, and then screw a 516 in it. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that ain't going to happen. You know that's that? asking a lot. <laughs> yes, it's asking a lot. <laughs> so I, I come up with a few things now. I come up with the uh, a 516 bushing, so you become 38. I also allow a new bushing you can put on the back of it. And then I also a lot, not to mention, I also changed the material on the, um, on the, oh, the first generation is originally GL5. Then I found out it doesn't work. Uh, the only, I only make, I think 50 of them back in, that would be 2008 is where I got the pattern. Well, I immediately find out if, if with that GL5, there's nothing I can do. It's so freaking hard. You can't stall it. You have to grind it. Then I talked to uh, my very good titanium supplier with a long discussion on metallurgy, behavior, and so on. When he told me Audi did the same thing with their exhaust system, they all, they all changed from the original stainless steel to GL2 titanium on the exhaust. Well, guess what? The moment you did that, the exhaust is totally quiet and there's no rust ever. That's pretty sweet. And exactly. And not to mention, is fifty is close to forty five percent lighter than stainless steel. Yeah, that's cool. So, and then on uh, because of the way the Azerbaijan, like, like the Titanium Valley, which is the the northeast corner of uh, of China and also the of on the Central Asia, that from that point like your Azerbaijan, your Kazakhstan, and all those, they have titanium. It's called the Titanium Valley. I really learned a lot more about titanium, what you can and cannot do. Titanium is not magic, but the moment you use it correctly, it's literally magical. I mean, I got so many customers call me on the, on the PSE, especially on the crossbar, and a few guys using the arrow bump. You need to talk to the guy who actually use it and not just shoot it a few times, but actually spend a week shooting their bow. Ask them what they feel. Yeah, I think you'll be surprised with think, how good it really is. Yeah, I think it's something you've talked about it before. Like you can't really describe how it feels until you actually go and feel it. Yeah, I mean, just like my Aero Concept system. I remember the first time I come up that in two thousand and eight, and a very nice gentleman of, out of, out of uh, Ohio and his buddies, they all go to ATN and see me and learn this system. Three of his buddies dropped the aero concept system in less than a day. He shot it for a week. Then he called me. He said, Dodge, you really need to shoot it and understand what it does. It is different. But the moment I did, it did exactly what you said. But I have to really know what I'm looking for. Well, I was actually superbly impressed on the gentleman. Because himself, like his three other friends who just shot the thing for one day and say, oh, it's no good. It doesn't behave like it is. It, first of all, this is the funniest statement I always heard. It doesn't shoot or behave like what I have. If it does, why are you buying it? Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, what, there's so many change? guys. Right, exactly. I mean, just like Sobel said, this is different from what I have. If it's the same as what you have, why do you need it? I mean, it's, it, it, the word better, that means better means it's different, right? If it's better, it does not mean the same. So if it's different and you ask it to be the same, what are you really asking it to do? Right. I think it, in some way, I think the archery industry, especially, I know everybody's not a, a scientist or, or or what you call it. Most of them are weekend warriors. Yes. And I know I'm going to offend somebody saying it, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I think it's the right thing to say. In archery, you can't buy success, not like in guns. Because at the end of the day, I can't hold your bow. But in, in gun, you can at least got a nice tripod. You can have success just because you pay for something. And if you don't understand, I think you need to find a new sport. I hope I didn't offend too many people, but I'm telling you the truth. You can't handle the truth. What can I say? Yeah, I think uh, 
yeah i mean i couldn't agree more i i think uh i think that's a good place to end here for today uh, we yes, actually, I we agree actually with just it. talked about that a little bit ago so folks let that sink in um and as as in anything like george said uh archery is not a place not archery is not a sport that you can buy your way to the top so um take that for what it's worth i hope you guys enjoyed this podcast thanks for tuning in george you're going to be at the great american outdoor show next week what booth you, yes. have, you have two booths what booth numbers are those and where can people find you i don't really remember to be fair with you but uh i'm I, i'm going to jump between two and because the reason i do that because a lot of times i want to focus on where i am most probably i will focus on the non light and knock portion and then i'll let my because my, 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 uh, my pro staff who are very versus in my broadhead and light and knock, I will, I will go, I will deal with the tools, the arrow bump, the titanium, and the arrow step. Because I really think that most people now, after all these years, they should know how the Finox system worked already. And I yeah. think my pro staff were able to handle it. Sure. Well, for anyone, uh, Dorge is going to be in the booth right across. One of the booths is going to be right across from our booth. And the archery hall, that's booth 927 for us. And I believe 928 for one of yours. And then I don't know the other one, but I know it's right across. The other the one's on the back. Us. Yes, yes, yes. Those so, it would be. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. So you have any questions or you want to come see this stuff in person, come check us out. And with that being yeah. said, George, we'll talk to you soon. Yes. I'll see you in the Pennsylvania show.